Book Four, Part One of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The Aeneid by Publius Vergilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Four, The Passion of the Queen, Part One. But anxious cares already seized the queen. She fed within her veins a flame unseen. The hero's valour, acts, and birth inspire her soul with love and fan the secret fire. His words, his looks, imprinted in her heart, improve the passion and increase the smart. Now, when the purple morn had chased away the dewy shadows and restored the day, her sister first with early care she sought, and thus in mournful accents eased her thought. My dearest Anna, what new dreams affright my labouring soul! What visions of the night disturb my quiet and distract my breast with strange ideas of our Trojan guest! His worth, his actions, and majestic air a man descended from the gods declare— Fear ever argues a degenerate kind. His birth is well asserted by his mind. Then what he suffered when by fate betrayed! What brave attempts for falling Troy he made! Such were his looks, so gracefully he spoke, That were I not resolved against the yoke of hapless marriage, Never to be cursed with second love, so fatal was my first, to this one error I might yield again, for since Sichaeus was untimely slain, this only man is able to subvert the fixed foundations of my stubborn heart, and to confess my frailty, to my shame, somewhat I find within, if not the same, too like the sparkles of my former flame. But first let yawning earth a passage rend, And let me through the dark abyss descend. First let avenging Jove with flames from high Drive down this body to the nether sky, Condemned with ghosts in endless night to lie Before I break the plighted faith I gave. No, he who had my vows shall ever have, For whom I loved on earth I worship in the grave. She said, the tears ran gushing from her eyes and stopped her speech. Her sister thus replies, Oh, dearer than the vital air I breathe, Will you to grief your blooming years bequeath, Condemned to waste in woes your lonely life Without the joys of mother or of wife? Think you these tears, this pompous train of woe, Are known or valued by the ghosts below? I grant that... While your sorrows yet were green, it well became a woman, and a queen, The vows of Tyrian princes to neglect, To scorn Hyarbas and his love reject with all the Libyan lords of mighty name. But will you fight against a pleasing flame? This little spot of land which heaven bestows on every side is hemmed with warlike foes. Gaetulian cities here are spread around, and fierce Numidians, there your frontiers bound. Here lies a barren waste of thirsty land, and there the Syrtes raise the moving sand. Barcaean troops besiege the narrow shore, and from the sea Pygmalion threatens more. Propitious heaven and gracious Juno, lead this wandering navy to your needful aid. How will your empire spread, your city rise from such a union? and with such allies. Implore the favour of the powers above, and leave the conduct of the rest to love. Continue still your hospitable way, and still invent occasions of their stay, till storms and winter winds shall cease to threat, and planks and oars repair their shattered fleet. These words, which from a friend and sister came, with ease resolved the scruples of her fame, and added fury to the kindled flame. Inspired with hope the project they pursue, on every altar sacrifice renew. 
a chosen you of two years old they pay to Ceres, Bacchus, and the god of day, preferring Juno's power, for Juno ties the nuptial knot and makes the marriage joys. The beauteous queen before her altar stands, and holds the golden goblet in her hands. A milk-white heifer she with flowers adorns, and pours the ruddy wine betwixt her horns, and while the priests with prayer the gods invoke, she feeds their altars with Sabaean smoke. With hourly care the sacrifice renews, and anxiously the panting entrails views. What priestly rites, alas, what pious art, what vows avail to cure a bleeding heart? A gentle fire she feeds within her veins, where the soft god secure in silence reigns. Sick with desire, and seeking him she loves, From street to street the raving Dido roves. So when the watchful shepherd from the blind Wounds with a random shaft the careless hind, Distracted with her pain she flies the woods, Bounds o'er the lawn, and seeks the silent floods, With fruitless care, for still the fatal dart Sticks in her side and rankles in her heart. And now she leads the Trojan chief along the lofty walls, amidst the busy throng, displays her Tyrian wealth and rising town, which love without his labour makes his own. This pomp she shows to tempt her wandering guest, her faltering tongue forbids to speak the rest. When day declines, and feasts renew the night, still on his face she feeds her famished sight. She longs again to hear the prince relate his own adventures and the Trojan fate. He tells it o'er and o'er, but still in vain, for still she begs to hear it once again. The hearer on the speaker's mouth depends, and thus the tragic story never ends. Then, when they part, when Phoebe's paler light withdraws, and falling stars to sleep invite, she last remains when every guest is gone, sits on the bed he pressed, and sighs alone. Absent her absent hero sees and hears, or in her bosom young Ascanius bears, and seeks the father's image in the child, if love by likeness might be so beguiled. Meantime the rising towers are at a stand. No labours exercise the youthful band, nor use of arts, nor toils of arms they know, the mole is left unfinished to the foe. The mounds, the works, the walls neglected lie short of their promised height that seemed to threat the sky. But when imperial Juno from above saw Dido fettered in the chains of love, hot with the venom which her veins inflamed, and by no sense of shame to be reclaimed, with soothing words to Venus she begun. High praises! Endless honours you have won, and mighty trophies with your worthy son. Two gods a silly woman have undone. Nor am I ignorant, you both suspect this rising city which my hands erect. But shall celestial discord never cease? Tis better ended in a lasting peace. You stand possessed of all your soul desired. Poor Dido with consuming love is fired. Your Trojan with my Tyrian, let us join. So Dido shall be yours, Aeneas mine. One common kingdom, one united line. Eliza shall a Dardan lord obey, And lofty Carthage for a dower convey. Then Venus, who her hidden fraud descried, Which would the sceptre of the world misguide To Libyan shores, thus artfully replied, who but a fool would wars with Juno choose, And such alliance and such gifts refuse, If fortune with our joint desires comply? The doubt is all from Jove and destiny, Lest he forbid with absolute command To mix the people in one common land. Or will the Trojan and the Tyrian line In lasting leagues and sure succession join? But you, the partner of his bed and throne, May move his mind, my wishes are your own. Mine, said imperial Juno, be the care. Time urges now to perfect this affair. Attend my counsel and the secret share. 
when next the sun his rising light displays and gilds the world below with purple rays the queen aeneas and the tyrian court shall to the shady woods for sylvan game resort there while the huntsmen pitch their toils around and cheerful horns from side to side resound a pitchy cloud shall cover all the plain with hail and thunder and tempestuous rain the fearful train shall take their speedy flight dispersed and all involved in gloomy night one cave a grateful shelter shall afford to the fair princess and the trojan lord i will myself the bridal bed prepare if you to bless the nuptials will be there so shall their loves be crowned with due delights and hymen shall be present at the rites the queen of love consents and closely smiles at her vain project and discovered wiles the rosy morn was risen from the main and horns and hounds awake the princely train they issue early through the city gate where the more wakeful huntsmen ready wait with nets and toils and darts beside the force of spartan dogs and swift massilian horse the tyrian peers and officers of state for the slow queen in antechambers wait her lofty courser in the court below who his majestic rider seems to know proud of his purple trappings paws the ground and champs the golden bit and spreads the foam around the queen at length appears on either hand the brawny guards in martial order stand a flowered simar with golden fringe she wore and at her back a golden quiver bore her flowing hair a golden call restrains a golden clasp the tyrian robe sustains then young ascanius with a sprightly grace leads on the trojan youth to view the chase but far above the rest in beauty shines the great aeneas the troop he joins like fair apollo when he leaves the frost of wintry xanthus and the lycian coast when to his native delos he resorts ordains the dances and renews the sports where painted scythians mixed with cretan bands before the joyful altars join their hands himself on synthus walking sees below the merry madness of the sacred show green wreaths of bays his length of hair enclose a golden fillet binds his awful brows his quiver sounds not less the prince is seen in manly presence or in lofty mien now had they reached the hills and stormed the seat of savage beasts in dens their last retreat the cry pursues the mountain goats they bound from rock to rock and keep the craggy ground quite otherwise the stags a trembling train in herds unsingled scour the dusty plain and a long chase in open view maintain the glad ascanius as his courser guides spurs through the vale and these and those outrides his horse's flanks and sides are forced to feel the clanking lash and goring of the steel impatiently he views the feeble prey wishing some nobler beast to cross his way and rather would the tusky boar attend or see the tawny lion downward bend meantime the gathering clouds obscure the skies from pole to pole the forky lightning flies the rattling thunders roll and juno pours a wintry deluge down and sounding showers the company dispersed to covert's ride and seek the homely cots or mountains hollow side the rapid rains descending from the hills to rolling torrents raise the creeping rills the queen and prince as love or fortune guides one common cavern in her bosom hides then first the trembling earth the signal gave and flashing fires enlighten all the cave hell from below and juno from above and howling nymphs were conscious of their love from this ill-omened hour in time arose debate and death and all succeeding woes the queen whom sense of honour could not move no longer made a secret of her love but called it marriage by that specious name to veil the crime and sanctify the shame the loud report through libyan cities goes fame the great ill from small beginnings grows 
swift from the first and every moment brings new vigour to her flights new pinions to her wings soon grows the pygmy to gigantic size her feet on earth her forehead in the skies enraged against the gods revengeful earth produced her last of the titanian birth swift is her walk more swift her winged haste a monstrous phantom horrible and vast as many plumes as raise her lofty flight so many piercing eyes enlarge her sight millions of opening mouths to fame belong and every mouth is furnished with a tongue and round with listening ears the flying plague is hung she fills the peaceful universe with cries no slumbers ever close her wakeful eyes by day from lofty towers her head she shows and spreads through trembling crowds disastrous news with court informers haunts and royal spies things done relates not done she feigns and mingles truth with lies talk is her business and her chief delight to tell of prodigies and cause a fright she fills the people's ears with dido's name who lost to honour and the sense of shame admits into her throne and nuptial bed a wandering guest who from his country fled whole days with him she passes in delights and wastes in luxury long winter nights forgetful of her fame and royal trust dissolved in ease abandoned to her lust the goddess widely spreads the loud report and flies at length to king hyabas court when first possessed with this unwelcome news whom did he not of men and gods accuse this prince from ravished garamantis born a hundred temples did with spoils adorn in ammon's honour his celestial sire a hundred altars fed with wakeful fire and through his vast dominions priests ordained whose watchful care these holy rites maintained the gates and columns were with garlands crowned and blood of victim beasts enriched the ground he when he heard a fugitive could move the tyrian princess who disdained his love his breast with fury burned his eyes with fire mad with despair impatient with desire then on the sacred altars pouring wine he thus with prayers implored his sire divine great jove propitious to the moorish race who feast on painted beds with offerings grace thy temples and adore thy power divine with blood of victims and with sparkling wine seest thou not this or do we fear in vain thy boasted thunder and thy thoughtless reign do thy broad hands the forky lightnings lance thine are the bolts or the blind work of chance a wandering woman builds within our state a little town bought at an easy rate she pays me homage and my grants allow a narrow space of libyan lands to plough yet scorning me by passion blindly led admits a banished trojan to her bed and now this other paris with his train of conquered cowards must in afric reign whom what they are their looks and garbs confess their locks with oil perfumed their lydian dress he takes the spoil enjoys the princely dame and i rejected i adore an empty name his vows in haughty terms he thus preferred and held his altar's horns the mighty thunderer heard then cast his eyes on carthage where he found the lustful pair in lawless pleasure drowned lost in their loves insensible of shame and both forgetful of their better fame he calls Silenius, and the god attends, by whom his menacing command he sends. Go, mount the western winds, and cleave the sky, then with a swift descent to Carthage fly. There find the Trojan chief who wastes his days in slothful riot and inglorious ease, nor minds the future city given by fate. To him this message from my mouth relate not so fair venus hoped when twice she won thy life with prayers nor promised such a son hers was a hero destined to command a martial race and rule the latian land 
who should his ancient line from Teusa draw, and on the conquered world impose the law. If glory cannot move a mind so mean, nor future praise from fading pleasure wean, yet why should he defraud his son of fame, and grudge the Romans their immortal name? What are his vain designs? What hopes he more from his long lingering on a hostile shore, regardless to redeem his honour lost, and for his race to gain the Ausonian coast? Bid him with speed the Tyrian court forsake. With this command the slumbering warrior wake. Hermes obeys. With golden pinions binds his flying feet and mounts the western winds. And whether o'er the seas or earth he flies, with rapid force they bear him down the skies. But first he grasps within his awful hand that mark of sovereign power, his magic wand. With this he draws the ghosts from hollow graves, with this he drives them down the Stygian waves, with this he seals in sleep the wakeful sight, and eyes, though closed in death, restores to light. Thus armed, the god begins his airy race, and drives the racking clouds along the liquid space. Now sees the tops of Atlas as he flies, whose brawny back supports the starry skies. Atlas, whose head with piney forests crowned, is beaten by the winds, with foggy vapours bound. Snows hide his shoulders. From beneath his chin the founts of rolling streams their race begin. A beard of ice on his large breast depends. Here, poised upon his wings, the god descends. Then rested thus he from the towering height, plunged downward with precipitated flight, lights on the seas, and skims along the flood, as waterfowl who seek their fishy food, less and yet less to distant prospect show. By turns they dance aloft and dive below. Like these the steerage of his wings he plies, and near the surface of the water flies. Till, having passed the seas and crossed the sands, he closed his wings and stooped on Libyan lands, where shepherds once were housed in homely sheds, now towers within the clouds advance their heads. Arriving there, he found the Trojan prince new ramparts raising for the town's defence. A purple scarf with gold embroidered o'er, Queen Dido's gift, about his waist he wore. A sword, with glittering gems diversified, for ornament, not use, hung idly by his side. Then thus, with winged words, the god began, resuming his own shape. Degenerate man! Thou woman's property, what makes thou here, these foreign walls and Tyrian towers to rear, forgetful of thy own? All-powerful Jove, who sways the world below and heaven above, has sent me down with this severe command. What means thy lingering in the Libyan land? If glory cannot move a mind so mean, nor future praise from flitting pleasure wean, Regard the fortunes of thy rising heir. The promised crown let young Ascanius wear, To whom the Ausonian sceptre and the state Of Rome's imperial name is owed by fate. So spoke the god, and speaking took his flight, Involved in clouds and vanished out of sight. The pious prince was seized with sudden fear. Mute was his tongue and upright stood his hair. Revolving in his mind the stern command, he longs to fly and loathes the charming land. What should he say? Or how should he begin? What course, alas, remains to steer between the offended lover and the powerful queen? This way and that he turns his anxious mind, and all expedients tries, and none can find. Fixed on the deed, but doubtful of the means, after long thought... To this advice he leans. Three chiefs he calls, commands them to repair the fleet and ship their men with silent care. Some plausible pretense he bids them find to colour what in secret he designed. Himself, meantime, the softest hours would choose before the lovesick lady heard the news, and move her tender mind by slow degrees to suffer what the sovereign power decrees. Jove will inspire him when and what to say. 
they hear with pleasure, and with haste obey. But soon the queen perceives the thin disguise. What arts can blind a jealous woman's eyes? She was the first to find the secret fraud, before the fatal news was blazed abroad. Love the first motions of the lover hears, quick to presage and even in safety fears, nor impious fame was wanting to report the ships repaired, the Trojans' thick resort and purpose to forsake the Tyrian court. Frantic with fear, impatient of the wound, and impotent of mind, she roves the city round. Less wild the Bacchanalian dames appear, when from afar their nightly god they hear, and howl about the hills and shake the wreathy spear. At length she finds the dear perfidious man, Prevents his formed excuse, and thus began. Base and ungrateful! Could you hope to fly, and undiscovered, scape a lover's eye? Nor could my kindness your compassion move, Nor plighted vows, nor dearer bands of love. Or is the death of a despairing queen Not worth preventing, though too well foreseen? Even when the wintry winds command your stay, you dare the tempests and defy the sea. False as you are, suppose you were not bound to lands unknown and foreign coasts to sound. Were Troy restored and Priam's happy reign, now durst you tempt for Troy the raging main? See whom you fly! Am I the foe you shun? Now, by those holy vows so late begun, by this right hand, since I have nothing more to challenge but the faith you gave before, I beg you, by these tears too truly shed, by the new pleasures of our nuptial bed, if ever Dido, when you most were kind, was pleasing in your eyes or touched your mind, by these my prayers, if prayers may yet have place, Pity the fortunes of a falling race. For you I have provoked a tyrant's hate, Incensed the Libyan and the Tyrian state. For you alone I suffer in my fame, Bereft of honour and exposed to shame. Whom have I now to trust, ungrateful guest? That only name remains of all the rest. What have I left, or whither can I fly? Must I attend Pygmalion's cruelty, or till Iabas shall in triumph lead a queen that proudly scorned his proffered bed? Had you deferred at least your hasty flight, and left behind some pledge of our delight, some babe to bless the mother's mournful sight, some young Aeneas to supply your place, whose features might express his father's face, I should not then complain to live bereft of all my husband, or be wholly left. End of Book Four, Part One The dewy shadows and restored the day, Her sister first with early care she sought, And thus in mournful accents eased her thought. My dearest Anna, what new dreams affright my labouring soul! What visions of the night disturb my quiet and distract my breast with strange ideas of our Trojan guest! His worth, his actions, and majestic air a man descended from the gods declare. Fear ever argues a degenerate kind. His birth is well asserted by his mind. Then what he suffered when by fate betrayed! What brave attempts for falling Troy he made! Such were his looks, so gracefully he spoke, That were I not resolved against the yoke of hapless marriage, Never to be cursed with second love, so fatal was my first. Book Four, Part One of the Aeneid This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons The Aeneid by Publius Vergilius Maro Translated by John Dryden Book Four, The Passion of the Queen 
Part One. But anxious cares already seized the queen. She fed within her veins a flame unseen. The hero's valour, acts, and birth inspire her soul with love and fan the secret fire. His words, his looks, imprinted in her heart, improve the passion and increase the smart. Now, when the purple morn had chased away the frontiers bound, here lies a barren waste of thirsty land, and there the Surtees raise the moving sand. Barcaean troops besiege the narrow shore, and from the sea Pygmalion threatens more. Propitious heaven and gracious Juno, lead this wandering navy to your needful aid. How will your empire spread, your city rise from such a union, and with such allies? Implore the favour of the powers above, and leave the conduct of the rest to love. Continue still your hospitable way, and still invent occasions of their stay, till storms and winter winds shall cease to threat, and planks and oars repair their shattered fleet. These words, which from a friend and sister came, with ease resolved the scruples of her fame, and added fury to to this one error I might yield again, for since Sicaeus was untimely slain, this only man is able to subvert the fixed foundations of my stubborn heart, and to confess my frailty, to my shame, somewhat I find within, if not the same, too like the sparkles of my former flame. But first let yawning earth a passage rend, And let me through the dark abyss descend. First let avenging Jove with flames from high Drive down this body to the nether sky, Condemned with ghosts in endless night to lie Before I break the plighted faith I gave. No, he who had my vows shall ever have, For whom I loved on earth I worship in the grave. She said, the tears ran gushing from her eyes and stopped her speech. Her sister thus replies, Oh, dearer than the vital air I breathe, Will you to grief your blooming years bequeath, Condemned to waste in woes your lonely life Without the joys of mother or of wife? Think you these tears, this pompous train of woe, Are known or valued by the ghosts below? I grant that... While your sorrows yet were green, it well became a woman, and a queen, the vows of Tyrian princes to neglect, to scorn Hyarbas and his love reject with all the Libyan lords of mighty name. But will you fight against a pleasing flame? This little spot of land which heaven bestows on every side is hemmed with warlike foes. Gaetulian cities here are spread around, and fierce Numidians there your 